No matter where you are in the world, the morning commute is familiar to everyone. For some people, this involves a drive, a walk, a cycle, or a bus ride. For the people living in the suburbs of London, the commute mostly involves hopping on a train to get into the city. In the UK, we are all familiar with getting the train. The biggest concerns being if it will actually show up on time, if it will even show up at all, and if you'll be able to sit down when it does arrive. However, on the 8th of October 1952, what should have been a normal morning, a normal commute to work, soon turned into a morning where the daily commuters of London wondered if they'd ever even see their work again. This is the story of the Harrow and Wealdstone rail crash. It was a foggy morning and the 731 Tring to Euston train was running late. The train that usually followed this one had been suspended which meant the people who normally travelled on that train had to opt for the earlier service, which resulted in the train being very busy. The total seating capacity was 756, but there was an estimated 827 people on board when it pulled into Harrow and Wealdstone Station. Harrow and Wealdstone Station had opened in 1837 and was a rural stop surrounded by fields. The train had pulled in at approximately 8.17 and was there for just two minutes before disaster struck. An overnight train from Perth to Edinburgh, whose driver overshot signals outside the station, hurtled at full speed and straight into the back of the Tring and Euston train, which was already at the platform. Mr John Bannister, a passenger on the train, told reporters, it all happened in a second. There was a terrific crash and glass and debris showered me. There were 15 people in the compartment with me and we were all jammed together in a mass of broken wood. I blacked out for a moment and when I came round, I found I was lying on the railway line with debris on top of me. I managed to free myself and drag myself up onto the platform. The scene was indescribable with people groaning and crying for help all around me. I dragged several from the wreckage, including an old lady. The impact of the crash was huge. It caused debris to be thrown onto neighbouring tracks, and a few seconds after the first crash, a train from Euston to Liverpool hit the debris going 60 miles per hour and crashed into the wreckage, causing it to catapult into the air and plough into a footbridge. A total of 112 people were killed, and 340 people were injured. All six lines running through the station were quickly closed to allow emergency services to get to the scene, which they did in a matter of minutes. Along with the fire brigade, ambulances and police service, many members of the United States Air Force who were stationed five miles away rushed to the scene applying life-saving techniques they'd learned in the war. The efforts of the emergency services and the United States Air Force managed to save countless lives and several of the rescuers were noted by name for their exceptional assistance. This included the likes of Mrs. Lillian Culverwell, who worked on the scene for 12 hours, and 14-year-old boy Gilbert Powell, who applied first aid skills he had learned from school. An investigation was launched and tests showed there was no signal and equipment faults. The driver of the Perth train had not slowed his train in response to the signals and then passed two danger signals before colliding with the train train. The evidence suggested that the driver had made no attempt to stop until the very last moment. This could have been due to the weather conditions, but no one except the driver knew. The driver unfortunately died on impact. The Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, visited the scene and praised the efforts of those involved in the rescue. A memorial plaque for the disaster was unveiled in 2002 to mark the 50th anniversary of the incident. This was, and remains, the worst UK rail disaster in peacetime.